Turn with me in your Bibles this morning. I'm going to take us just a little bit off course from Matthew, although I will include a few verses there. But turn in your Old Testament to Exodus chapter 14. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. I'm going to skip through uh, a few verses to tell the story here. Uh, follow along. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Powerful words. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites, move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand. The seed will divide and the Israelites will cross on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army and his chariots and his horsemen follow through. They will know that I am God when I glory through Pharaoh. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. And Moses stretched out his hand. And all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong eastern wind and turned it into dry land. And the waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and left. And the, Egypt, the Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed along them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord did look down from the pillar of fire and the cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed up the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow and conquer the Egyptians and their chariots and the horsemen. Moses did as he instructed. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites went into the sea. None of them survived. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they put their trust in him and in Moses. Pretty powerful message. Yeah. I wonder if God has said to any of us, stop complaining, get up and move on. For I will conquer your enemies. I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, my, my grandparents on both sides of my family I uh, come from a little town in Arkansas, Beach Grove, Arkansas. Went my whole life believing that I will never meet anyone from Beach Grove, Arkansas. Just a little town. Everyone has either died or moved on. And I come to church here, and Charlotte figures out that Ira Rogers, my grandfather, was her childhood pastor in Beach Grove, Arkansas. Did you know that? Gwen and I have traveled across uh, Arkansas many times, and, and there are some churches that still bear the name somehow of my grandfather, Rogers Memorial Church, or uh, some part of the building will say Rogers on it. In fact, not too long ago, Charlotte, they, they've closed that little church. The town's gone, as you know. The, the, the wind blew, and the town went away with it. 
And the little Nazarene church that I grew up in has been closed. And we were driving by there and uh, found out that it was closed. Well, there's a there's a sign up on the up over the the, the uh, fellowship hall. They had a church building and a fellowship hall. And up over the fellowship hall was the sign that said Rogers Memorial Fellowship Hall. And I have taken pictures under that sign with my kids and then my grandkids. Uh, I couldn't imagine losing that sign, and so while Gwen peered over my shoulder making sure no one was watching us, I climbed up a ladder and pulled that sign down, uh, and that's going to be on my shop here just pretty soon. It's sitting in my garage. I stole a sign right off the church. God forgive me. I would visit uh, my grandparents on a regular basis. In fact, I spent much of my summers uh, growing up in Beach Grove, Arkansas. I can tell you a lot of stories about them, my grandparents on both sides. My mom's parents uh, were the hardest working people I've ever known. Uh, they would tend to the farm, grandpa would tend to the farm, and grandma would tend to the, to the garden. Now, for most of us, a garden is that little patch outside where we raise a few tomatoes. But a garden for my grandmother was about five acres. I can remember going out to the garden, and, and, and she would she would take a she would take a, a watermelon right out of the ground, and we would go to the side of the house and we'd cut that watermelon and break it open, and we would eat that fresh watermelon right out of the ground. And I don't I just can't remember anything tasting any better than in that than just having that out of the garden. She worked hard all day, and then in the evening, as, as so many farm mothers would do, she would prepare that great meal. And, and we had a lot of family living in the area, and so they all knew to come over to Grandma's house, and, and we would have a big dinner celebration. And she would prepare some of the finest food that you will ever eat. And you can tell I've eaten just a little bit of that food. Wonderful meals that she would prepare from scratch, and, and it was uh, it was just such a celebration together in her kitchen, and, and uh, the, the smells. <clears throat> we ate, by the way, in the kitchen. We, we didn't have a dining room. We, we ate in the kitchen. You're supposed to eat in the kitchen. <laughs> and, and, and there was flour still, still on the shelves where she had made the bread that morning, and, and you could still tell where she had prepared the, the pie for dessert. And, 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 and the, the greens that, that she had snapped that morning, and just all of the ways that she would prepare that meal. And I, I, can, I can vividly recall it, the smells and, and, and the food. Homegrown canned pickles, fresh garden tomatoes, homemade rolls, vegetables that just came right out of the garden smells and the laughter and having the family gather around the table, those are the memories of my childhood. But then after the meal, something would happen. Grandma said the words. These are the greatest words, just short of being in the Bible. She would begin to pick up all of the, the, the plates and, and pick up all of the, the, the extra food and she would start putting all of that away. But, but just to make sure that we all stayed at the table, she said these words, keep your fork. Now we knew what that meant. Something really good was about to happen. Something that would change your life forever. Dessert was coming. Now, I'm not talking about a jello salad uh, or a little bit of fruit. I'm not talking about store-bought pastries. I'm talking about homemade, finger-licking, better than a pig in dirt dessert. <laughs> Fresh apple pie with homemade crust and melted homemade ice cream that we had made that day. I'm talking about some of the best food that you will ever eat. We were on holy ground when the dessert came. <laughs> I think if that's what heaven is like, and I think it is, I think if that's what heaven is like, I, I don't really care how you dress me up when I die. You can put me in blue jeans and a t-shirt. You can save a few bucks and, and, and just bury me out back for all I care. But before you put me in the ground, Stick a fork in my hand. 
Because something better is coming. Right? You get the idea. The Israelites were set free from hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt. Moses and, and that tribe of people were marching out of Egypt. They were marching away from captivity for the first time since Abraham's family had fled the droughts of Canaan. In a twist of the story, they, they fled from Egypt only to find themselves confined by the Red Sea. They knew that Pharaoh's armies were following. He, he, he changed his mind. You, you remember the story. He let them go, and then he began to feel kind of foolish about doing that. And in an act of revenge, he calls up the very best of his army, all of the chariots, all of the horses, and he chases after the Israelites. And the Israelites were no warriors. They weren't accustomed to battle. They didn't have any defenses pre prepared. They didn't have chariots and horses. They didn't have the weaponry of war. And they get to the Red Sea, and they're standing there, and they could see the cloud of dust behind them from where Pharaoh was approaching them, and they began to grind. Now, isn't it just like people who have seen God work miracles, who have watched God do amazing things among us, but just when the least little trouble starts coming our way, what do we do? We start griping. We look around and we wonder, how did I get in this mess? And they started complaining. Why did you bring us here? We're better off, this is what they said, we were better off as slaves. What a shame. We can hardly pause to celebrate victory before shaking from some new crises that plagues our busy lives. And I know they're out there. I know we have problems. I understand that. It's just daily life. We just struggle, don't we? There's just so much against us. We could stop and complain. I, I am sure, I, I said it in our prayer, I, I know we all brought baggage with us this morning. I, I know we're struggling against things. I know it's easy to get discouraged. But I think God is saying to us this morning, stop griping and move on. I've got great things in store for you. I, I already know the end of this story. I win. <laughs> Move on. Stop complaining. God is ever present. He doesn't leave. He's not too busy. He has a plan. Don't let circumstances fool you. There's higher ground ahead. Amen. Each step forward is a mile away from the past. The roadblocks that we think are in front of us, and I know they seem immense, are just building blocks of opportunity to watch God do something great in our lives. Remember last week he said, follow me. Keep your fork. We're in a great adventure together. Let's move on. Three things. First of all, stand firm and see the deliverance that God will bring you. Watch what God is doing. In the few moments that God would part the water and the dry ground would appear and the millions of people that, uh, of Israel that would walk across and their livestock and their wagons and all of their belongings, they couldn't imagine what God would do. And they'd have missed it if they hadn't moved on. You can't imagine what God is going to do for you. Move on. Children of Israel were a part of what we call the Exodus today and the Red Sea and, and that event would shape their history forever and, and they commemorate it. It's a part of every worship service that they experience to remember how God set them free from Israel. It is a part of every Christian service today that we remember that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He died on the cross. He lives again. He has conquered the grave and we must follow Him. It's who we are. He is alive. He is risen. He is indeed here today. I've watched God provide countless examples of his patience 
and his providence in my own life. I've watched him change people who were privileged to know his grace. His timing is incredible. He has just the right answer at just the right time. His healing occurs when everything else has failed, when all of our resources are exhausted. His finances sneak through when you don't even know how to ask for it. It always comes at the right time. He knows that we are in need and he provides the resources even before we ask. He lends a friend to us in prayer so that we can overcome the crisis. We could run, we could complain, we often do, but stand firm and see the miracle. You remember a lesson in, in, uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, which was really a lesson to his disciples. He thought it was necessary to teach his disciples to pray. I, I, I thought about that for a while, that, that Jesus stopped and he taught us how to pray. He, he, he didn't, in that process of prayer, do a grandstand kind of prayer. He began, our Father. We have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. He is the great I am. When, when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He didn't say I am the God of the sun or the God of the moon or the God of the skies or the God of the seas. He just said, I am. I am. He is the God. The only God. No other God can stand against him. Our Father. We approach our Father in love. We don't have to try to get his attention. We don't need to butter him up. He stands ready for us. And then just Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. I would like to stop there. I wish we had time just to study that one short scripture. I think it is life changing. I, I get stuck there every time I read it. You know, in our home, we buy a loaf of bread and by the end of the week, we have to throw part of it out. We just can't eat that much bread that fast, just the two of us. We don't even think about needing to buy the bread. We just, we just go and buy the bread. I wonder what it might be like just to depend on God for my daily bread, for my every needs. That I would so, I would so sacrifice everything that I have that I would be totally dependent on God. You know, there's never enough stuff. We will never buy enough stuff. It will never totally please us. But for some reason, the bread of God is completely satisfying. Give us this day our daily bread. Like the Israelites, we fuss and worry about all of the immediate needs that we have. Will we make it? Do we have enough? In reality, we can't imagine what all the things God has in prayer and ready for us. We follow Christ, and it is a great adventure, and he said it would be a life of abundance. Second lesson, it's a done deal. The Lord will fight for you, he said, just be still. Martin Luther wrote these words. I love this great old hymn. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath, his name. From age to age, the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has will his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim. We travel not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fail him. God's in charge. 
He's in the middle of all of the stuff that we're in. The family tension that you have, God is there. When your money runs out, God is there. When you are discouraged, He is there. When you feel alone, God is there. The Lord will fight for you. Stand and watch Him win. It's a done deal. Lesson three. Let's move out with anticipation. Move on. It must have taken some kind of faith to move forward knowing that those sea walls could collapse at any time. Bible theologians tell us today that the Red Sea was only about three or four deep, three or four feet deep, that, that the miracle really couldn't have happened. And I think it's even a greater miracle that all of Pharaoh's army drowned in about three feet of water. <laughs> Let's step out. There are greater things ahead of us. Don't look at the past. Keep your fork. I love the old chorus. I think I can sing it to you. Don't cringe too much. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears dismay. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Sing it with me. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. I faith on heaven's table land. just in front of you. We must tell this story. It is our story. Imagine what it meant for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or imagine what it was like to be David in the lion's den. Or to Peter when he denied his Savior. Stand firm. Keep watch. God will win the battle. And move on. The story was spread out ahead of the Israelites. The enemies gave second thought to attacking these folks because God was marching with them. That's our story. Word gets out when God's people are living with authority. Keep your fork. Heavenly Father, today we've assembled because we trust a mighty God. We've seen you do it before. Forgive us for having such doubts. We've seen you move at our altars. Forgive us for not trusting you. We've seen you lift up our folk that are sick and you've healed them. Forgive us for thinking that this world doesn't have anything better. Father, give us trust in the almighty God who's called us today to move on. Let this congregation say, I'm going on. I'm moving forward. And Father, bless us with a great future. We'll keep our forks. In Jesus' name.